What is up, everybody? My name is Kyle Matovic. I am the host of the In Liberty and Health podcast, where we talk all things liberty, health and wellness, and beyond. My hope is to encourage and spread the message of liberty and physical and mental well-being. I hope you enjoy all the topics we talk about with our guests. We're on all major streaming platforms, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Man, I'm doing as good as anyone can do getting buried by his 13-year-old son on leg day. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for not being on this podcast because I got to go see Metallica. So if that's a problem, kiss my ass. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> all right. All right, everybody, this is In Liberty and Health. I don't even know what fucking episode it is, but I'm also happy to be joined today by Justin Campbell returning to the show. We discussed abortion last time, and I'm also happy to announce that we're now brought to you by and hydrated by Element Electrolytes. Um, I've had the owner of the show on twice to check out episode 27 and 57, if I remember correctly, with uh, the owner of the company, Rob Wolf. Anyways, I don't want to get too uh, tangential on my hydration protocols. Justin, how you doing, dude? Not bad. Not bad at all. Good. Well, that's good to hear. Um, how are things over uh, Indiana way? It's been pretty good. It's uh, It is hot. Man, it's hot. I'm in the process of renovating a house, and I was putting flooring down today. And by about one o'clock this afternoon, I was completely soaked through all of my clothes. It, it looked like I jumped in the pool with my clothes on. So it is uh, rather warm around here. But other than that, everything's going good. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's good to hear. Is it like a dry heat? Or are you guys getting uh, hit with rain? Uh, we it is always humid here, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and we have had too much rain. My poor garden was mm. flooded out for about four weeks straight because it every, about every other day it rained and it is uh it's been kind of a sticky nasty mess it's not a not a great year for gardening but uh my tomatoes are gonna make pretty nice other than that the rest of it is kind of shot oh god damn it yeah um if you uh look at my yard right now this is like total dad shit but uh <laughs> my yard's about fucking as dry as it could fucking get like i uh didn't cut my backyard my backyard grows pretty quick um, I normally cut it like every week and like that's kind of pushing it a little bit. I went like two weeks without cutting it and there were still some spots where it was like when you ran it over with the mower, you got like nothing. So um, it, it's been a little dry recently. We had a little bit of rain the last couple of days, just kind of like a little sprinkling and then done, but nothing uh, like dramatic. So I feel like we're like doomed to get like a hurricane here in like a week. It's just going to be like, this torrential, terrible downpour. That's usually the way it goes. Weather weather comes in comes and goes in cycles, which the uh, the environmental nut jobs can't seem to figure out. But whatever. Yeah, no, the uh, ozone layers that are opening, they always tell you that they're opening, but they never tell you that they expand and contract, and that uh, you know that global temperatures kind of have this you know habit of going up and down. It's never just consistently up. It's never just consistently down. It's kind of a flex thing. You have know. you speaking of that? Have you seen the the chart that like. Um, it shows the North Pole and where the magnetic pole of the planet has shifted over the, like the last mm -hmm. 40 years. It's uh, it's really interesting. You should, for anybody listening, like Google it. It's uh, it's a it's just a map and it shows like the North Pole and it shows the different points where the magnetic pole of the planet has been moving over the last. Uh, I think it's like 40 years or something. It's, you know, it's funny. Is I actually, sorry to interrupt you, but I Googled it. And uh, one of the first results was North Pole magnetic field shifting. Um, it it really is really says, interesting. And it, like when you think about it and you think about like, so like we've been seeing uh, warmer temperatures over the last, say, 20 years, like in this part of the planet. Well, mm -hmm. if you look at how the that polar, like the true polar north has shifted, it would make sense because the the way it's shifted it would it would bring like this part of the world mm -hmm. a little closer to what would be like the e the equator part mm -hmm. or you know around that uh, positioning in in space as, as it would go oh so uh, yeah so is this what you're referring to yeah 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 so okay, um, and if you look at this one the one that says so NASA suggests magnetic north that, so that shows like the different points that it's been kind of moving around to. Uh, okay. um, huh. So it is it is really interesting, kind of how that shifts and 
And so it, it also kind of plays into and, and explains why we see um, temperature changes the way we do and, and why the weather patterns are, you know, different from decade to decade. It's, it's not because humans are uh, destroying the, the planet and the environment. It's because, you know, planets do what planets do. Yeah, that's actually like a incredibly simplified way of looking at it like there's all this propaganda and fear you know pennsylvania florida the whole east coast and most of the west coast is going to be underwater but it's actually just the fact that you know the planet's kind of shifting in the way that it rotates around the sun and this sounds so fucking like stupid and trippy when you start thinking about it but it's like how do we know how the earth kind of rotates around the sun like we can't physically observe this because imagine how far out you would have to fly and how long you'd have to sit there to watch this happen and how can we know that it doesn't stay in the same place that it maybe doesn't go up doesn't go down kind of like what that graph suggesting that over time it's it's not just going to move consistently you know in one way it's going to be you know maybe a little bit of that right bodies in space are mm -hmm you know likely to shift and, and move around it's not like um you know it's not like the the diorama that you made in junior high where you, right. you know, put the planets out around the sun like they're not earth isn't running on a perfect track around the sun like things are uh kind of free floating and have the ability to to shift and move throughout space so yeah, yeah there's there's a lot there's a lot more to it and and especially when you go back and you look, because uh, like ancient civilizations did actually keep track of, of the weather fairly well. Like they had good record keeping systems throughout history. And when you look at, at that and the different climate changes that they've gone through over the millennia, like it's pretty easy to see kind of how this stuff ebbs and flows throughout history. So yeah, it's uh, there is a, a lot of complication put into something that's, uh, obviously a complex issue but also very relatively easily explained type of an issue yeah well the one saying that i keep kind of coming back to uh one of the people i listen to a lot his name is rollo tomasi his uh saying is if there's no boogeyman nobody gets paid and the more and more you think about that that's like the most applicable saying across anything you could possibly think of well, why do we have to have voter fraud? Because if there's no boogeyman, nobody gets paid. Why do we have to have systemic racism? Because if there's no boogeyman, nobody gets paid. Why do we have to have climate change? The more and more you apply this, the more and more you see, oh yeah, well, of course, they don't want to fix these problems because who gets paid? If you fix the problem successfully, then you know there's no way to pad your pocket. Well, and that's, like, that's something that you can look at with the health industry itself. Like mm -hmm. that is... Uh, the health industry has been completely overtaken by a lot of these ideas that like there has to be something wrong if there's not something that you know the we've all heard the saying if uh, a healthy patient doesn't make money you know like, yeah. if, there has to be something wrong um, I actually did an episode with Eric Larson who is a uh, he's a doctor in Michigan and, and works for Michigan State and, and he also does a show called The Paradox where we talked oh, about right, like yeah. how how over the years the medical field has gone from being very doctor driven to being very administration driven and like the more layers of administration that have gotten added the more levels of bureaucratic bullshit that's gotten added to that industry and like he he gave the example of uh having to have like a, a heart monitor put on for a while and he decided to go through his insurance to to have it done and after like months and months of paperwork and ridiculous bullshit he was finally able to get insurance to pay their part of it. And then they gave him this like big discount on it. And because the insurance paid for it. And so they did all this and gave him like a thousand dollar discount. And he ended up paying the exact same if he had just like his doctor normally doesn't run through insurance. So yeah. She was like, we can give you this heart monitor. It'll cost you like 250 bucks. And by the time he got done with months of rigmarole through the insurance companies and, yeah. and everything else, they finally gave him all these huge discounts and, and let him have it for like 250 bucks. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And the, the, what you said there earlier kind of reminded me of a saying that people always say is uh, a patient cured is a patient lost. And generally with the, 
medical industrial complex, it literally is, let's hand you a pill, right? Your high cholesterol isn't from lack of a statin, right? This is lifestyle induced. Diabetes is generally lifestyle induced. Now, obviously there's people who are born with like type one diabetes and that's very, very unfortunate. And I'm not putting down obese people. I always have to throw all these qualifiers in there. Um, I, I literally had a, my fiance's parents one friend had got on me saying oh, i'm not a bad person because i'm obese and I, I i i've never said that i've never said that obese people are bad people and every time i do a show that explains anything about obesity or health i i always put this caveat there that you're not a bad person if you're obese you should love yourself no matter what and if you think you're fine the way you are then i'm nobody to tell you anything right what I do with the show is put the information out there, right? I'm going to give you the tools, the research I do, the research we did on abortion, right? These are tools in your tool belt. So that way you're better informed to make a better decision on whatever you're going to do. Um, but, you know, so insulin and all these different things that the medical industrial complex basically rolls out, you know, you're once again, your high cholesterol isn't from lack of a stat. Your high cholesterol is lifestyle induced. It's because you've ate a piss poor diet for 20, 30 years, and now your blood markers are out of whack because you've treated your body like shit. Okay, we'll start treating yourself a little better, um, a little bit better, start eating better, start sleeping better, start moving around a little bit. And then, you know, if that, you know, if we've thrown everything in the kitchen sink at it, then okay, let's talk about a statin. But for some reason, the first thing is, uh, I think they say the average time with a patient is like seven to 10 minutes. The, you can't cover everything that needs to be covered to fix somebody in seven to 10 minutes. I mean, that's something that you need to build capital with the person um, and, and develop some kind of relationship to kind of see where they're coming from. So you can tell them where they're going wrong and where they can improve. Yeah, it, it's, when we look at all the sciences as they're construed in this modern academia, mm -hmm. none of them put an emphasis on solving problems. They're all about finding ways to keep the problem relevant so that you can continue to milk research money out of it or like- well, It's, it's symptom-based treatments. And you know, it's interesting that you, you bring the symptom-based treatment up so because we had had a little bit of a, a discussion about this on Twitter a few days mm -hmm. ago, a small problem that, that I've kind of run into with some of libertarianism, I, I still consider myself more or less libertarian, but like a lot of people are really good at, at um, explaining the symptoms and, and prescribing your, or explaining, you know, what's, what's wrong, but, but kind of like with the other sciences, we're not doing a whole lot in terms of actually solving those problems. It's a uh, it's mitigated mitigated response to to address something that's going on um, very presently, but it doesn't do a whole lot of long term solution type type of thinking on stuff. So yeah, maybe you wanted to pivot into that. Uh, I'm not sure. No, no, no. I'm actually really glad that you turned it over there. Um, I think libertarians, especially when it comes to political stuff, were. 100% spot on when we point to the issues that face us, right? The military industrial complex, the Federal Reserve, um, banking cabals, you name it. We're, we're spot on when we know these issues. But the only problem is, is that w nobody ever stops and thinks, okay, well, what's the steps to fix this, right? People say, oh, well, abolish it. Okay, well, <laughs> what does that look like? Because you're going to massively fuck things up if you just come in with a hammer and want to break everything. And I, I mean, I'm okay with that to a degree, but okay, well, what's that look like after that? How do we get there? And, and people say, uh, like, they, they'll say something like, oh, well, I'm all for incrementalism. Okay, well, if you're like, is there another option? I don't, are you just going to end the Federal Reserve tomorrow? That's not going to fucking happen. It's not going to happen. It's the same deal with Ancapistan. Not going to happen, at least not in our lifetimes. We can get closer to there, but what, you know, what, what are you going to do to get us there? This is why I can't stand the quote tweeting battles and why I don't even listen to like libertarian philosophy all that much just because it's like, okay, this is interesting, but what's the application, right? Uh, like I was saying earlier, when it comes to the show, I want to give you tools to put in your tool belt so that way you can be better informed, make whatever decisions about your health possible, or even political paths. I've done, or I don't want to say debates, but um, 
basically conversations surrounding political strategy. Let's arm people with the tools to let them make the best decision going forward. So, you know, how, how do we move forward as libertarians to a society with more liberty? I, I'm, I'm open to any suggestions, you know? Yeah, and that's that's kind of the thing. Um, so it's become kind of a dirty word on and and liberty Twitter, but and uh, the the post libertarian thing, which yeah. uh, I guess uh, you know that's probably that's probably more or less where I would say that I have found myself falling. Um, um, I've I've gotten a little bit back to some of my more right wing roots, just in looking at kind of the uh, the way that things have kind of. Sh- played themselves out over the last mm-hmm. couple of years and and what's been going on um so yeah like a lot of the i think a lot of the problem that is prescribed with uh, or to post-libertarianism is that it's uh it's all about like trying to devote all your time to just being a gop uh knob gobbler and that's not at all that's like not at all what it is like if you actually talk to anybody or listen to anybody the uh the strategy with the gop um as far as like that goes is find people who suck and go primary them and get them out it's not if somebody is a republican and they're bad will you support them because they're not a democrat it's if they're bad get them out because you have a better opportunity to actually win win positions of influence by getting them out, not by running as a third party candidate. Because like the, the big problem, the reason I started doing my show was to explain libertarian ideas and also to explain what was what was wrong with the fact checkers. Because at the time you see all the fact checkers with all of their bullshit and, and if you read the headline. And the first paragraph, yeah, it looked like they were fact checking something. But if you read the rest of the article, what you found out was what you found out was yeah. that they were actually through the article. They said, "Yeah, this was actually correct, but we don't like the way they said it, so we're going to say that mm-hmm. it wasn't correct." So right. that that was that was what really kicked it off. But then also, as I was talking about some of these things, and I was referring to libertarianism, I had a lot of friends who would send me messages. They're like, "What's what's a libertarian? I've never heard of that." Because I, I am from very rural Kentucky, where it's it's all either blue dog Democrats or like Bush GOP. So so mm-hmm. the, you know there there is no real nuance in the conversation. So I was trying to explain what libertarian ideas were, but that kind of brings me back around to you know why I've kind of moved more towards li- the post libertarian side of things is because there are so many people that they have no idea what any third party is like they don't even know that third parties exist um you know i mean that's just like the sad reality of it and so if you're going to have impact and influence especially in small communities which i'm like if we're being honest that's that's where you have the most opportunity to make a significant impact is in a small community Mm -hmm. um you have to align with the things that people understand. Otherwise, you're, you're just pissing in the wind. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's kind of where the post-libertarian strategy is going, is that it's, it's not that you support Republicans because they're not Democrats. It's that you either support the good Republicans, or if you are in a place with a bad Republican, you get them out. You primary them, you put pressure on them, you move the needle on local level where it's actually impactful. Yeah, yeah, and I've been 100% guilty of straw manning post-libertarians as, and you know what's funny is I, I talk to these people frequently and you know, sometimes your brain just wants to have the easy way out. And in most regards of my life, I'm actually not that kind of guy. Like when it comes to my exercise, and my routine and my diet, I'm religious about tracking food, about training extremely hard, even when I know I'm not feeling it. I'm very, very consistent about that shit. But um, then like sometimes with, especially Twitter, Twitter makes for such a good medium for you to just do everything wrong, communicate in the worst way possible, misunderstand everybody and piss everybody off. It is phenomenal at that. So, um, 
it's why I kind of like having conversations specifically like this because you get a little bit more of a nuanced view. Um, the only thing that kind of makes me scratch my head with the post libertarians and I don't care whatever political path people get right. And this is where a lot of libertarians get hung up is that they get stuck on. It has to be the libertarian party. I don't care. I don't care if there's good Republicans. Okay, cool. If there's good libertarian candidates, perfect. Um, but it, you know, they have to be reasonable and they have to be winnable races, right? Like in Pennsylvania, I've, I've talked about it ad nauseum, but there've been plenty of people who won either uncontested or contested races here for different local positions. Um, literally a dude like three blocks away from me is a city councilman as a libertarian. He's a narco-capitalist that's going to a Grove City College for economics. I mean, this dude's, he's fucking awesome, right? Okay, so he's a good libertarian who got elected. Um, but when it comes to um, like, I guess my problem is people are just dogmatic about it, who say it has to be this way. Okay, well, here in Pennsylvania, people seem to like libertarians. Like my bass player, my band, he's a fucking die in the wool Trump supporter. Um, maybe that's a little bit of a strong man on my part. Um, he really, really likes Trump, but um, he voted for Gary Johnson in 2016, and then in 2020, he voted for Trump, right? But he really liked Trump, and he kind of bit on a lot of the Trump bullshit. He's a little bit of a China hawk, too, which, okay, whatever you're whatever um but when it came to him hearing about pencil or um libertarians here in pennsylvania getting elected he was excited about that because he doesn't want democrats in <laughs> that's the way most people in pennsylvania feel in red counties right i'm in westmoreland county um they're in armstrong county allegheny County's a little bit blue but like most counties in fucking pennsylvania are red i mean it's the fucking woods out here dude <laughs> like people hate democrats especially after 2020 or yeah 2020 where uh, you had governor wolf with a fucking tranny beside him telling him that you know we're supposed to lock down the state for your health people fucking hate democrats so they're gonna go for anything that isn't a democrat so fuck they'll even swing for libertarians but if there's republicans on the ballot um you know this is why i like brandon harnish so much because he's willing to work with people right I want people to work together. If you can use the Libertarian Party strategically to win, to advance liberty in your community, perfect. GOP, perfect. I don't care. Well, what's what's your end goal? That, that should be the question that everybody's asking, but I don't think everybody's asking that question. Or if they do ask it, they paint the other side disingenuously and say that, oh, the GOP will never be able to do that. Well, in different areas, maybe you're right. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is the most vehicle or the most useful vehicle at this specific place at this specific time for liberty. Then put your resources there. Don't fool yourself and like pigeonhole yourself into one position and ultimately fail to use a better tool that's available to you. So let's, um, I'm glad you brought up Brandon because, yeah. like, when the conversation that he and I had, he, um, I was planning to run for a county council position in mm -hmm. the county that I used to live in. Uh, we moved, and so that kind of messed my plans up. But, you yeah. know, it's... Yeah, it's I listened better. to that conversation this morning. It was, it was good. And it, it, it was a really good conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, Brandon is awesome. And yeah. and like I said, you know, in that, uh, we moved. It was better for us personally as a family. So, you know, I, I can put political aspirations aside for a few years and, and yeah. do, what's, uh, do what's best for us you know that's a, a lot more that's a lot more important than anything political ever Absolutely. will be yeah. um, but like if I was going to run there if I knew for a fact that I would be running uncontested I would probably run as a libertarian but if if I was going to be if I was going to have a challenger then I would have run as a republican like mm -hmm. because because of the county it's an extremely red county and for as for as much as most of the people who live there hold to a lot of libertarian ideas and ideals, mm -hmm. they don't know what it is. So if I'm like if I'm going to be running in a contested race, then I have to do what's practically useful to to actually win and be able to uh, to make an impact in the community. Like if, if I run as a libertarian and I lose to a bad Republican, then I've accomplished nothing. It, whereas if I can run as a Republican and when, then I can bring the libertarian ideas to that position. You know, you don't have, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, vote gold no matter what. It's, uh, I mean, that's, you know, that's that dogmatic uh, bipartisan politics or, uh, you know, duopoly politics thing that, you know, we all hate so much, mm -hmm. but hearing 
libertarians espouse those same ideas, it's a uh, it, it gets a little bit off off putting, honestly. Yeah, yeah, and, and especially and a lot of this stuff. I think you probably feel the same way when we talk about this. It's like we're talking to ourselves because we realize that we have done this at one point or another. And I, I it's a conversation I had with Mark Claire, you know, this is something that we're all guilty of. It's talking to your younger self and to other libertarians who you see kind of falling into the same trap. Um, I, I just cannot stand the dogmatism that some people put down when it comes to political stuff. And it's not just libertarians, it's Republicans too. It's sometimes post-libertarians, it's Democrats, it's all people who just dogmatically have to, you know, it has to be this party, it has to be this guy, no nuance, you know, GOP or die, libertarian party or die. It, it, you, you disgust me because you're you're not considering once again, that there may be other areas or other tools that may be better suited for the job at hand. Like um, my buddy, Mark Bazaka, who lives on the other side of the state, he was pulling 40% as a libertarian in uh, like straight blue counties. Right. So once again, there's going to be some people who just will not vote Republican, no matter what, same way that there's going to be some people who will not vote Democrat, no matter what. So maybe they would vote libertarian if you're in a blue county and you hit on the right issues strategically, and then you get their vote. And then you can also hit on, um, you know, more Republican issues, depending on the area that you go to. So the way that he said he did it, he had his, um, you know, yellow pamphlet essentially for independents, red pamphlet for Republicans, and then blue pamphlet for uh, Democrats. Whenever you go door knocking, and you you kind of observe the house and observe or observe the general area to get an idea of the kind of person you're dealing with, so that when you approach, you give them this pamphlet that has these issues all expressed in a libertarian way that's going to appeal to them, so they kind of buy into what you're selling. Right? It, it's it's kind of like marketing, honestly. So that's. I think that's at the heart of my criticism of uh, Hector Roos running for governor in Florida is mm -hmm. there are a lot, and I don't disagree with Hector and Josh and the other Florida libertarians and the things that they've talked about with the things that uh, DeSantis has not been good on. Mm -hmm. my, my problem is they have a lot of opportunity to do other things. And I know they said that like, I don't know, for some reason, the Libertarian Party of Florida doesn't uh, doesn't run candidates for positions and stuff like that, which seemed really weird to yeah. me. Like, that's kind of the sole purpose of the Indiana Libertarian Party is to, to find races and run candidates. So, you know, if, if you're not doing that, what are you doing? But that's neither here nor there. Like, there is a lot of opportunity there in the state of Florida to, to go challenge bad Republicans. And, and Florida has had a large influx of um, out of staters who are probably not exclusively Republican, that you have an opportunity to hit on those really important topics in those uh, unchallenged seats with a libertarian candidate. If you don't, you know, if you're not going to play uh, the two party politics game and you want to run a libertarian for something, then go run for these state house positions and run as a libertarian. Hit the topics that are important to Democrats, hit the topics that are important to independents, and then find the things that these different state senators and state Congress people are bad on and hit those with their base, where that even if you don't win a vote, you put that in, in the head of their constituents and people write letters, people make phone calls, like people will get on the ass of their elected representatives and say, hey, why are you doing this? The, like that is one of the most, uh, it's one of the most effective ways that you can invoke change is to get in their ear. So like there's a lot of opportunities if, if red flag laws are going to be that big of a problem in Florida, if not having constitutional carry is that big of a deal in Florida, don't run somebody for governor against DeSantis where you have maybe an opportunity to get 3% of the vote, run people against these bad Republicans around the county or around the different counties and push them. Push the 
push their voting base to say, look, I'm not going to vote against you, but why are you doing these things? And, and actually, like, get in the ears of the people who are making decisions. It's a lot easier to, to get the state legislature on your side and make change in that way than it is to try to win a governorship coming out of left field, especially when even if you do win the governorship, what's it going to accomplish? Because you, you still aren't going to get anything done because the state legislature is going to be run by all of the bad Republicans that you've been complaining about. Yeah, well, you know what? This is why I uh, I got to give a shout out to Dennis Misigoy, who's running against Marco Rubio for uh, I think it's his congressional or Senate seat. I, I can't remember which one it is, but uh, Dennis actually was on a city council. I want to say I'm, I'm probably butchering his uh, backstory, but uh, if I remember correctly, he consistently voted against like tax increases and stuff like that. And he was a libertarian too, down in Florida. So. Um, to kind of move on to the Hector Roos deal, um, I think it's going to be very, very inconsequential either way. Um, when you have all these people moving to Florida, they all know DeSantis loves his people. DeSantis will fight to keep them free. And yeah, there may be some stuff that we don't like, but generally I think his heart's in the right place. And I think that he's looking from uh, old school George Bush kind of Republican view and saying, I'm going to treat my people great, right? Um, I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure that their quality of living is as high as possible, right? Especially after 2020. Um, so that being said, all these people that moved in, I mean, I think it was like over 100,000 um, registered Republicans moved to Florida. The likelihood that any of them if they move to Florida, especially from a blue state as a Republican or even as a Democrat, the likelihood they're going to vote for a libertarian after seeing what Ron DeSantis did in 2020 up to now, I think there's like 0% chance that they're going to say, yeah, well, we're just going to vote, you know, libertarian, just to vote libertarian. They're going to be like, no, no, we're not risking this. We moved down here because DeSantis has kept Florida free, you know, or at least relatively free when you th- consider all the other states. Um, there's no way in hell we're going to risk jeopardizing this. So when people like get worried about him being primaried by Hector Roos, I'm like this dude has like 300 followers on Twitter. Like th- this, this is a joke. Uh, and I'm sure he's a great libertarian. I'm sure he's a great guy. I listened to his debate with uh, Clint from Liberty Lockdown and I, I came away better informed than I did listen or er, um, going into it. Right. It's just nobody cares about the libertarian candidate for governor of Florida, right? Everybody's eyes are on DeSantis. If you look at his whole cabinet that he has down there, which like, just just think about me saying that, right? Which governor has like a whole cabinet of people that are firebrands that like love him and support him and have like a quarter of the following that his fucking cabinet does. I mean, this dude's like, he's literally like the king of Florida. There is 0% chance that there's any libertarian that's going to make a dent in his chance for re-election, or at least in, in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, but I it just like when you understand and you actually look at the data of people moving down there, I, I don't think it, there's any risk to DeSantis. And there, yeah, there's still some blue areas, but right. Like I mean, we we have made the argument uh, myself and, and others in the camp mm-hmm. that you know you you do you run the risk of because. Florida has been traditionally a tight state. I mean, mm-hmm. what was it? It was only a couple thousand votes that DeSantis won by the first time to, yeah. you know, to a well, uh, once again, this was crackhead, but. 20, yeah, right, right. Yeah, fucking go. But uh, that was 2018, right? Right. And that, the right. only things part have, where, yeah. Yeah, things have changed since then. A lot. You know, we've, <laughs> we've had, we've had some, uh, some little blips on the radar here and there that might have might have changed the political landscape but yeah and like whenever we have made the arguments that you know you run the risk like now georgia on the other hand like there's a legitimate risk georgia because of the big cities in georgia and the voting blocks in those cities and the way they shift a vote like georgia is one that there is a legit risk that you go you end up with stacy abrams as your governor because of a libertarian but like in, in florida um I think more of my issue is not so much that he runs the risk of upsetting DeSantis so much as there's so much, so many and so much more effective 
methodology that you could be taking to to actually do something about it. Like yeah, if, I agree. Yeah. If you want to make change, go make it. Don't like politics is not where you're going to actually make change, especially in a state like that. Like you have infinite levels of opportunity to do much more with petitioning, lobbying, writing, you know, writing to Congress people, calling them, getting in their ear. Um, the lobbying stuff is, is really an effective way. Like if you can find people to, to go get in, in the ear of the right politicians in the state, that's, that's how you make change. And I guarantee you there, are, there are politicians in that state who already lean that way, but they don't have any backing. So if you can get, you know, enough support for that, you can move the needle pretty quickly. I mean, uh, Indiana had shot down constitutional carry because of the police unions and stuff. I want to say it was last year mm -hmm. and turn around and come into this year and it got passed because the right lobbying groups were able to, to get in the ears of the right people and make it happen. And it like they, it already went into effect. They went quick. Like Georgia, Georgia also got constitutional carry passed this year, but it doesn't go into effect until like January. So I think it's like at the end of the year uh, for Indiana, they're like constitutional carry. It goes into effect in June. Like we're, they're not wasting any time with it. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, that's how you make change is to, to put a bug in the ears and, and actually get their attention. Like running a, running a campaign and getting 3% of the vote doesn't get anybody's attention except for the 3% that voted for you. Right. Well, and on top of that, to your point, um, it's like you said, there, there's so many more different effective things you could do, but think about the reputation cost. So um, when you run against somebody like DeSantis, I guarantee you, every single Republican who thinks that their governorship could be jeopardized because you're running as a libertarian will hate you, right? Now, when you have somebody like Marco Rubio, who the base is kind of shaky on, and you could primary somebody like that, okay, well, maybe you gain some favor. But like when it comes to good Republicans, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who the Libertarian Party prior to you know the takeover they couldn't stop propping this this woman up and, and look I, i've had her on the show i like angela she's a good person she probably just run somewhere else because like trying to primary marjorie taylor green will guarantee you that every single republican that was like iffy on libertarianism in georgia will never vote libertarian again right that, that's a surefire way to piss everybody off. So kind of a long-winded way to say, um, don't run against good Republicans because it's just a surefire way to just, it, it's a bad overall cost. And, you know, maybe there's an argument about ballot access, but like, just think about what this actually means. Do you care about liberty or do you care about the Libertarian Party? I care about liberty. Well, so, okay, so the thing about ballot access, because I hear this get brought up a lot, Mm -hmm. The thing about ballot access is it almost never has anything to do with the governor race. Okay. It almost never has anything to do with senator races. Like they usually base it on uh, like like for here in Indiana, it's based on secretary of state. And okay. all you have to do and all you have to do is get four percent. If you get four percent, then that guarantees ballot access. Mm -hmm. So it's not even something that like it's not like you have to have a you have to get a huge amount. You just have to strategically uh campaign in the right places to get yourself to the four percent so like indiana's i think indiana's had ballot access for uh libertarian party of indiana has had ballot access since 1994 mm -hmm. like you you just have to campaign the right way but they never make it they never make it typically based around one of these big important spots it's always one of the other down ballot things sure and, and and in, in the states that it's not based on voting, it's just a matter of getting the money together and getting some signatures. Like, I know that's a kind of an off-putting thing for libertarians, but it's also not that hard. Like, if, you, mm -hmm. if you've got a support base, you can get that taken care of fairly easily. So, like, I, mm -hmm. I, the ballot access argument is, um, while I agree with the idea that everybody should have equal ballot access. 
you still have to play the game the way it's currently being played. And if they say that you have to get these signatures, then you, you go get your signatures. Like if they, uh, so Indiana did try to change that. They, um, after the 2020 election, the Indiana or the Libertarian uh, governor candidate got 13% of the vote, which Whoa. is, you know, phenomenal. I mean, that's, yeah. it, he was, he was running against a very bad Republican incumbent and an even worse de Democratic challenger. So mm -hmm. he got 13%. Um, I think the, I think the Republican, I'm pretty sure, um, I'm pretty sure Holcomb got like 64, 65% total, like not a resounding win for a super majority red state like this is. Right. Um, but it was, you know, because the Libertarian got 13%. And also in 32 or 33 counties, the Libertarian actually placed second in the county. Uh, like in a state of 90 or so counties, uh, over a third of them, the Libertarian placed second. In all of the debates leading up to the election, uh, the, the, the Libertarian candidate was winning the debates by like 80% to whatever the other two got. Like he, he was consistently following the debates, polling as having won the debate handily. Wow. It got the ideas out there. Um, like, bec and because it got the ideas out there, the, uh, the Indiana State Legislature attempted to change the way libertarians get on ballots in certain counties uh, because they're because local is the most important uh, way to do politics. There are certain counties that don't recognize the state uh, guideline on that. Like you have to get, you have to do specific things to get ballot access in certain counties. And so in order to maintain the ballot access on those counties, uh, the state legislature was going to change some certain stipulations where that if you're going to be on the ballot, you have to get, whereas originally you had to get like, I can't remember what it was, like 1200 signatures or something like very easy. Yeah. Um, and that was not like 1200 signatures in the county. That was like 1200 signatures, period. <laughs> so, you know, easy, easy to meet guidelines. They were trying to jack it way up and change it. And uh, because there are liberty friendly uh, members of the state legislature, and we do have an actually really good, strong libertarian party here in the state, they, they talked to them and they said, look, if you do this, it kills us in these counties. If you will agree to let us have access to, to put a member on an election, on the election boards, then we'll agree to it. Like we'll, we'll get the signatures. That's not going to be a problem. We're, we're going to be on the ballot. Uh, but you know, if you're going to change it, at least be reasonable and fair about it, because we're going to, if we have to get this many more signatures, then we should have a seat on the election board. Well, they scrapped the whole thing immediately because they do not want libertarians on the election boards because once they're on the election boards, then they have the opportunity to start making that, you know, that real change locally that we're talking about. So, you know, if, depending on where you live, like if you don't have that opportunity as a libertarian, you have to utilize whatever the, uh, the vehicle is that's available to initiate that change. That's like, like for the, you know, we got, like I said, we got the constitutional carry. It's like, you know, lobby, do what you need to do and get that in Florida. And when I said that, the, the guys who I was talking to at the time, they said, well, if we do that, then the, the GOP will just take credit for it. Like, okay, like you got constitutional carry. What does that matter? Like, <laughs> I mean, are you, you know, I don't get, I don't get what the problem is. Like, yeah. who, who gives a shit who gets credit at the end of the day? As long as it gets done, it gets done. Like, I, I'm, I don't understand <laughs> the problem with, like, if you can create. It's a fucking ego game at that point. <laughs> right. If you can create more freedom yeah. and liberty in your life, why does it matter if, the Republican Party takes credit for it, or the Libertarian Party takes credit for it, or God forbid the Democrats take care of it, take, take credit for it. None of that matters. You got more freedom in your life. You actually made change. That's that should be the that should be the most important thing. Not not a you know a dick measuring contest between uh, you know 
elephants, Republicans, and porcupines. Yeah, that's that's some of the funniest shit I ever heard. Like, I can't think of a better definition of LARPing than that. Like, oh, they'll get credit for uh, oh, okay, and that, that's like saying, okay, well, we abolished the Federal Reserve, but the Republicans did it so well, it, we can't do it. Like, to, to, you realize what you're saying, right? Like, the, the means have now, you, you, you've justified the end, right? Uh, you, you got to the end that you wanted. Right, so that's that's like cares? saying if, if Thomas Massey was successful in abolishing the Department of Education, that you wouldn't be behind that because it was done by a Republican with Republican backing and it wasn't uh, done by libertarians. Like the, I know that's, some libertarians that would totally say that. <laughs> absolutely. Like it's that level of insanity. I, I'm yeah. just, you know, like I get it. I am, I'm always going to, for especially personally, I'm going to align more libertarian on things. Like there are a lot of things that, um, I will never be a back the blue guy. My my episode that's going to be coming out Monday is a complete rant on like fuck the police. Basically, I will never be a back the blue guy. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I, it, there's just there's a lot of things that I think the Republicans get wrong. But if you have an opportunity to utilize that vehicle to get you from where we are to a point of more liberty, then that's the vehicle that you have to use. Like I, I just that's going to be my that's going to be my sales pitch for the you know the ideas of post libertarianism is that if you stay locked into the libertarian party line that's going to end in failure more often than not like as much as i love the libertarian party of indiana and i will be a supporting member i will like i will be a member of the party probably until i run for an office and have to not be and whenever i leave office then i will go back to be because like i believe in what the libertarian party of indiana is doing and they are doing good things and they have had the opportunity to actually win some of these battles but it's not a l that's getting stamped next to those wins and it doesn't matter because they're they are achieving the wins and that's what you have to do yeah yeah, and, and it's uncomfortable to hear that, but, you know, after 2020, if you didn't kind of shift your worldview and kind of think we need to do whatever's going to work, then you might still be stuck in, you know, December of 2019 instead of uh, July of 2022, because it, it's not like we can afford to fumble the ball. The way I kind of look at things now is that, like, on a federal level, you're fucked no matter what. Like, even if you elected... Oh, I've, I've surely said this enough ad nauseum on Twitter, but if you like Donald Trump again, even if he would have won in 2020, it, it, I think things would still look damn near the same, right? I mean, he was a vaccine shill. Um, he called the, the war in Ukraine a genocide. Things would largely be the same. If not, maybe in some regards even worse. Maybe a little bit better, like culturally and rhetorically or rhetorically, but like, because it or uh, amplified the left so much they became so much more aggressive right now that you have a weak figurehead like biden in it, it's it, you're not seeing them quite as amplified because there's no strong leadership right it, it's like his strategy is so loose just because there's no like defined goals because the dude's a fucking walking corpse right and when you look at him foreign policy wise he's a fucking disaster no matter what he does because it's just unmitigated let's try to go to war with absolutely everybody taiwan or you know fucking china russia whoever it is we're just aggress right um like I said, if Trump would have got reelected, things still would have probably been going down the shitter. We definitely would have seen the same inflation, and it, despite what people may think. Um, federal level I think politics. The only thing that I think the only thing that might have been different with Trump is you might have seen the energy policy be a little bit better. But you know, yeah, the, yeah, the, you, you know, know what? as soon as the Ukraine Russia thing happened, there's a good possibility that that, that goes out the window, and mm. at least we would have been better prepared leading up to that point but i don't and and honestly as soon as that happened i i'm instead of or you know because i i do think that trump probably would have taken the the same route that biden did 
and say that we're going to cut off Russian imports on oil and stuff. Yeah. And then at that point, he probably would have pumped up production from the U.S. Like U.S. Yeah. production would have gotten ramped up. So it it may have offset. You know, it may not have been as bad, but I do think you still would have seen a little bit of a a, a spike in like gas prices and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I think like overall, yeah, I, I just not a lot would would have been much different because the the bid that they made in 2020 with the way they did the lockdowns and everything, yeah. uh, you might have might not have seen as aggressive of a push for the man the vaccine mandate, but the vaccines were still going to get pushed. Just yeah. you know, the mandate might have been loosened up on, um, but you know the the economic collapse that we're seeing, like that's that's not just a result of biden administration like that's Mm -hmm. that was some years in the making um and now it's that was some years in the making that uh somebody cranked the treadmill up to 20 and Mm -hmm. ran it you know ran it forward a little bit faster is is all this really is yeah and most people and i'm terrible at this i'll I'll be the first one to admit it when i hear people say biden inflation or oh this is biden's fault um I just get frustrated because it's like, do, do you forget what happened in 2020? Because they'll, they'll gladly bring up the stimulus checks and the free money. But it's like, okay, well, who did that? Who signed all that in 2020? Um, yeah, f- federal politics to me is a crapshoot. Um, I think, honestly, no matter who you vote for for president, it's largely going to be a crapshoot. Um, when it comes to like a state level probably still relatively important and you should probably participate there um when it comes to a local level definitely you should try to do the best you can to kind of embolden and get as much you know more liberty-based people in wherever you can on the local level just because uh, that's going to be where you can make the most change effectively um when it comes to pretty much anything above the local level i I, like i said it's borderline a crapshoot federal level for sure a crapshoot if you have a not terrible sheriff and a good city and county council, that solves a lot of your problems. Like, mm-hmm. the, you know, after that, the next is like school board. You know, you need to have people on, on your county school boards and stuff like that. Like mayor or whatever. I mean, the, uh, the mayor of Evansville is hardcore leftist mm-hmm. and pretty bad. Evansville was no worse off than the rest of the state, honestly. Like you're the mayor, uh, the mayor to some extent is limited by what city councils, county councils, and the sheriff are willing to enforce. And like the sheriff was not willing to enforce lockdowns. So that means that it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, uh, there is a there is a lot of power that can be wielded outside of that office that uh, that can negate that so so having the right people in you know key positions is and honestly those positions like i talked about it with brandon uh because he 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 won his he up to i think it was last week there was a chance that he he was going to be opposed and his opponent uh didn't file decided not to run so he he will win running on a post a lot of those city and county council positions, that's kind of the way it goes. Like they typically run on a post. If you can get into one of those seats, you can stay in it as, as long as you're not terrible and you don't like draw the attention and the ire of the people in your county, you can just stay on it for forever. Like typically people don't run for those because they either don't want to put in the time or they just don't know what they're doing. Like if the county council isn't doing a bunch of stuff that everybody hates, then nobody's going to, nobody's going to bother it because everything's going good. As soon as they start doing bad things, that's when people start looking to run. And, you know, so getting in, be good, know what the people of your county actually want and make sure that, you know, they get to live freely. And, and you can stay there for as long as you want to do it. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, you know, kind of like we've kind of belabored the point. Um, 
that's really what more and more people need to do is just get involved locally because that's where you're going to be able to have the most effective change. And I like that you brought up the sheriff part and uh, it, it, because I'm not one of these libertarians who have always said um, all cops are bastards. And I, I don't like this to go back to the dogmatism. Um, I don't like this idea because in my experience, I've actually been treated very, very well by police. And if you do have, like you said, a good sheriff who's not willing to enforce lockdowns, well, you know, if all cops are bastards, but this dude's not enforcing lockdowns, are you going to go, like, tell this dude he's a terrible person because he's not a Rothbardian and cap? Um, now, if the dude's a Republican and he just hates lockdowns, doesn't want to enforce them or enforce gun laws, he's a good dude to me. Look, I, I don't care if he's a fucking neocon as a sheriff. Just fucking let me leave my house and go take my dogs for a walk in the morning, and we got no issues, dude. <laughs> and the crazy thing about the, the sheriffs here who said they wouldn't enforce lockdown stuff is they were Democrats. And Whoa. they came out and said, we're not going to enforce this stuff. This is not right. We're not going to do it. And then they switched parties and joined the Republican Party because Whoa. the because the because the Democrats pushing that uh, and that like that pushed them over the edge. Granted, the the Indiana um, the Indiana governor was not good on any of that, but mm -hmm. because he was so not good on it, the following year the state legislature stripped him of his emergency uh, powers. So, okay like yeah so your state did that too it's still it's still in uh he tried to appeal it and last i checked it was kind of dead in the water like it's still floating around out there but no like there's been no movement on it because he doesn't have a case like the the state legislature went through his emergency powers and said these are these are an overreach of the position and they're we're not going to allow you to have them anymore, which he suspended. Um, he suspended letting them go into session in the legislative session. So like that, that was a gross overreach of his power uh, by suspending the actual governing body of the state. So as soon as they were allowed to come back, they said, no, you're not going to do this again. Nice. Well, yeah, I think that's a victory for all. Justin, we've been shooting the shit for about an hour. I got a couple uh, last questions if you don't have any uh, anything else to add about the uh, strategy or anything else we hit on. Yeah, I think we beat that horse to death. Enough. <laughs> no, dude, it's an important conversation to have. So uh, what does liberty look like to you? For me personally or on more of a large scale? Whatever answer you feel is best. <laughs> you know, I think finding personal liberty is the most important part and um, getting away from cities is invaluable to that. Like even where we lived before, we weren't in the city, but we were close to it. Uh, and, and we relied on it for a lot of things, which is not, not a position that I necessarily want to be in. Getting, getting out where you have room to breathe and you have room to move and you can build things for yourself and for your family that you're not reliant on that system, that you're not reliant on um, other people so much. I mean, community is infinitely important. Having family members and people that you know and are close to, like community is important and being able to rely on those people is invaluable, but having to be reliant on random strangers in a large city or something like that—that's that's not a support structure that is uh, that's long-term uh, healthy. So, so being able to to be self-sufficient. To I went back and I listened to Matt Erickson saying, "Don't be poor." And then I also listened to my review of Matt Erickson saying, don't be poor. And I sounded really praggy when I, when I look back and I think about that. Um, because you know what's happened over the last year is I now make uh, one and a half times what I did at that point. And my wife makes about double what she did at that point. And you know, we don't have to worry about anything. And at the same time, we also moved and stripped 
about 60% of our bills. So not only are we making way more, we also have way less that we're responsible for. Yeah. And, and having that freedom, uh, it really makes a huge difference. And, and a lot of that was just hustling and figuring out what we were doing and, and being better at it, being willing to take risk and, uh, and move, like physically move and be uncomfortable in doing it. We're still uncomfortable in doing it. We're, we're not in the house that we're going to live in yet. And when all of the kids are here and two dogs and me and my wife in this incredibly tiny house, it is tight and it is hot and it is uncomfortable, but it is moving us in those steps towards where we want to be in two years, in five years, in 20 years, where the, we don't have to worry about anything. Uh, my goal is to, over the next two years or so, expand that garden to about twice the size that it is, get it uh, properly cultivated, where the, even in the event of a year like this year, where we have tsunami type rains for a month straight, uh, it's, it's set up where that it has proper drainage and, and we don't have to worry about it flooding out every week. Um, to expand the animals that we have, goats and chickens, I'd like to expand that. I want to do sheep and maybe a couple pigs and definitely rabbits where the, we provide all of our own meat all the time. We don't have to be reliant on stores and stuff like that. Uh, like, I want us to get to a point where this is all we need. And, and that, that's what liberty really looks like to me is is to be able to say, I am, I am free and independent of all of those shackles that the people who are, who are living in the city rely on for, I mean, for life, really. Yeah, no, I think it's a, a wonderful answer. Kind of reminds me of uh, the answer Dave DeCamp gave me um, when he mentioned liberty. He said, yeah, it kind of looks like living out in the country. And, uh, you know, thankfully we're not like, we're probably about an hour away from Pittsburgh, but um, it, it is kind of nice to go to local farms and go to like local businesses for all of your needs. It's there, there is something special about that, something you don't get from going to Costco and Sam's Club, which I go to, but um, I don't know. It, it's cool to walk into the turkey farm that's five minutes away from here or the beef farm or the little community grocery store and not only see people that you know, but also, um, just the the feeling of going somewhere that's not this big corporate place like you could tell that these people aren't insanely rich but they're they're just like you right and it is silly as it is to say it's, it's just kind of nice to to see that um what does health look like to you for me personally it's not having to go to the doctor uh that's i mean I actively avoid going to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, even even if I am legitimately sick, I I will fight it and not go for as long as I can. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> my my wife makes me go because I do occasionally actually probably need to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I I broke my ankle playing basketball a couple years ago, and Ooh. I was not. I was not going to go. I was, I was just going to put an ankle brace on and hobble around in crutches until it started feeling better. Um, and uh, I got COVID a few weeks ago, and, and so she made me go. And, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot that they could do for me because I, I am actually healthy, and, and it didn't have a whole lot of a, an, an impact on me. But not having to ever go to the doctor is kind of what I view as, like, being healthy. I, I went for – Man, other than like an annual physical, because um, we got a uh, we got a premium on our insurance, or we got uh, a discount. We got a discount on our insurance annually if you went and had an annual physical. So that was it. That was the one time uh, that I would go to the doctor was to get my physical done every year, and that, that was for probably I don't know four or five years up to the point that I, up, up until when I broke my ankle, like I didn't go to the doctor. Um, I. I eat 
mostly whatever I want, but I also work for that. Like I, I, I've been bad about it over the last couple months, but normally I run regularly. I play basketball regularly. Like I stay active. Um, I, if, if I start feeling like I'm not feeling right, then I, that's when I know that I need to start doing stuff again. And I really need to be more active. Like I do a lot of yard work. I do a lot of stuff with the, with the animals. I do a lot of, uh, like even when I'm not in the process of actively renovating a house, I build a lot of shit and, and work outside a lot. Like I, I'm always doing stuff. Um, and that, that as long as I'm doing enough of that stuff and I'm feeling it and I'm, I'm feeling like, like I, I can tell when I've been spending too much time sitting in my computer doing podcasts mm -hmm. and, and playing video games. Like yeah. I start to, I can start to feel it. Uh, you know, it's, it especially hits in the winter and, and that's when it's, you know, I have to like make an active conscious effort to, uh, to either start doing sit-ups and lifting weights here in the house and just to make myself be more active or, or get with my basketball group and, and start playing basketball more frequently and, and be consistent about it. Um, as long as I, as long as I'm feeling good, uh, I think, I think health is a tricky thing because everybody's body is so different. Like I, I can, uh, and I, you know, I know from experience from, I don't, I don't smoke anymore, but I used to smoke and I could smoke and drink Cokes and do all of that horrible shit and eat a pound of bacon every two days and, uh, you know, whatever. And I was still fine because, because I was so active all the time. Like, yeah, I might smoke three or four cigarettes a day and eat half a pound of bacon for breakfast every morning and drink Cokes and coffee all day long. But when I got home, I'd run five miles and then I would mow the yard and work outside and, you know, do stuff with the kids. And, uh, you know, I, I was always active. So health is kind of a, it's a very personal thing and, and figuring out what's right for you is of infinite importance because you know you know when your body's not right and 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 if you know it then it's you know the onus is on you that you've got to do something about it and and sometimes that's uncomfortable and sometimes you have to sometimes you have to make sacrifices and say yeah I'm I'm not going to do this I I need to go do something else I need to I need to actually carve time out of my schedule to be active and to to take care of me and maybe that even means that you have to you know you have to set other things aside but you know if, if you know that you're not feeling normal or you're not feeling good I, like I, I don't know how people wake up not being able to breathe or um you know not being able to move like go go do it go do something <laughs> like you know there are people who know what's going on with the human body that can help you mm -hmm. find solutions, like find the solution. I, I mean, it's, it, this has kind of been the theme of this show is like, if there's a problem, figure out what the problem is mm -hmm. and then go do something about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's cliche and as silly as it sounds, it's as actual as it gets, you know, whatever you could do to just be a little bit better than you are right now whatever you can do to make your government a little bit less of a burden right now, it's probably a reasonable course of action. Uh, Justin, I've enjoyed this conversation quite a bit, man. And uh, same with the last one. And we'll definitely uh, do another one. Um, where can everybody find you, dude? Yeah, it's uh, thanks for having me on. You can find me at, at jcamp1521 on Twitter and then uh, on YouTube, Rumble, I'm on BitChute and Odyssey, but I have not been as good about keeping up with the videos on those. But uh, mm -hmm. YouTube and, and Rumble are 100% up to date. And uh, YouTube and, er, and uh, BitChute and Odyssey are about a month and a half behind right now, just because I haven't been good at, about keeping up with those. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you can find me on all of those at the Fact Check This podcast. Nice, man. Well, uh, if you don't got anything else, we'll close her out, man. Yep, I think we're, I think we're good. I think... Uh, the only other, you know, the very last thing to, to kind of close it is uh, doing something is hard, but it's totally worth it. I agree, man.
All right, everybody, make sure you like, subscribe, and share. I don't know why I always plug this at the end of the show. You would think I'd be smart enough to plug it at the beginning of the show. Um, <laughs> like, subs- Yeah, I know. Dude, I'm so bad with it. Like, subscribe, and share. Check out LMNT Electrolytes. I'll have that shit in the link below. Uh, Axe and Sledge for all your jacked and tan supplements in case you're needing any. And until next time, everybody, take care and rock and roll.